Okay, welcome to the first recorded lecture for Demystifying Revelation. I think before we even get into this, um, one of the things I really want to describe a little bit is my approach to Scripture, and maybe that will help us um, uh, to come to a common understanding of a lot of things. Okay, when it comes to hermeneutics, hermeneutics is the interpretation of Scripture. I think rule number one is that God's word is inerrant. There is no errors in God's word. If we start comparing Scripture and we start seeing a contradiction, then all that tells us is that we have not properly interpreted scripture. We need to take it up to another level until whatever is possibly uh, conflicting each other has a common ground, a common understanding, a common interpretation. So that's rule number one. Uh, rule number two, scripture interprets scripture, which kind of goes hand in hand with what we just talked about. But this tells us First and foremost, first mention of uh, scriptural references is quite important because that kind of establishes um, the, uh, the base of what the original intent and original meaning is. And then for everything on top of that just starts to build on a common understanding. But I think even before all that, everything written in the Bible, Everything in Scripture. Now we're talking about in the original language. So the original text, original language, is place where it's place for a reason and a purpose. There's nothing arbitrary about what is recorded in Scripture. Everything has an intentionality to it. And once again, I think it's important that we talk about this in the original text, in the original language. Um, and we, we'll find out that there is just an amazing depth of understanding in the original language. Uh, we'll find out right away in, Re in Revelations 1, chapter 1, the Greek versus the, uh, the English. But even more than that, I think in the Hebrew, uh, the depth and the meaning and the dual meaning sometimes on words, how words are used specifically because they'll have two different meanings and both meanings apply, is there for a reason. It's there for a purpose. So the choice of nouns, the choice of verbs, the choice of verb tenses, we're going to find out that it's extremely important to look at verb tenses in the original language if we are not fully understanding uh, what is written in the English text. Because let me just say this, English translations are not inerrant. I'm sorry to say that, but um, English translators bring their own theology into translation, especially translations that are translated by committees, uh, now, like, for example, I use the NIV quite often because that's what I grew up with, but um, I cannot endorse the NIV as inerrant. There are many places in the NIV where it's just interpreted wrong or it's interpreted, shall we say, in a more politically correct fashion than what the, the original language uh, uses. Or... They'll work around, and this is English translators in, in, in general, instead of trying to translate the word, they'll just transliterate the word. And a perfect example would be the word baptize, baptizo, which means to immerse. How many translations do you see baptizo translated as immerse? You don't. What you see is a transliteration where baptizo becomes baptized and now we don't have to worry about the translation. So having said all that, let's start with demystifying revelation and what I think is a very important introductory text to all of this. And this is found in Matthew 
This is Jesus Christ from the Sermon on the Mount, and he made this amazing statement on the Sermon on the Mount, found in Matthew 5, verses 17 and 18, where he says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law. Whoa, wait a minute. Jesus himself says he did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come, not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now you might say, wait, especially the law. I thought the law was just nothing more than do's and don'ts. You mean there's fulfillment involved in in the law? There's obviously fulfillment involved in the prophecies of the prophets, but yes, I have not come to abolish them, says Jesus, but to fulfill them. I have come personally, I, Jesus Christ, have come personally to fulfill the law and the prophets. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, wait a minute, until heaven and earth disappear? What kind of statement is that? What Jesus is saying, until the end of time, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Now, how does that apply to us in Revelation? First and foremost, the Old Testament is fundamental to understanding Revelation. If you have not looked at the Old Testament and what the Old Testament has to say about end time events, then guess what? You will never, ever understand Revelation because Revelation is purposely at the last book of the, of the Bible for a reason, because it's a culmination. It's a culmination of everything that's been written in the law, in the prophets, in the gospels, by the, in the epistles. This is the reason why so many people don't understand Revelation because they don't understand everything that's in the Bible in front of it. Let me just say this. Not only if we don't read the Old Testament, we will not understand Revelation, but if we did not have Revelation, we would still have the complete story on what to expect for end times and the day of the Lord, which is where he comes to restore his kingdom. So let's move on. We're going to start with verse 1 of chapter 1 of Revelation. Okay, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. Okay, I use an old version of NIV, um, which says the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, if you use a new version of the NIV, it'll say the revelation from Jesus Christ. Well, there's a big difference between revelation of Jesus Christ and revelation from Jesus Christ. And then you start pulling up other uh, translations And some of them will say revelation of Jesus Christ. Some of them will say revelation from Jesus Christ. So what is it? Well, let's look at the original language. Guess what? In the original Greek language, there is no the, there is no of, there is no from. So what does it say in the original Greek language? It says revelation, Jesus Christ. So, You might ask the question, okay, now that I know that, is it the revelation of Jesus Christ? Is it the revelation from Jesus Christ? What is it? And the answer is yes. That's the importance of going back to the original language. The original language did not specify. The original language said, revelation, Jesus Christ. Guess what? It's a revelation of Jesus Christ, big time, and it's a revelation from Jesus Christ, big time. So, revelation, and what's the about, what about the word revelation? Revelation is apocalyptic, and that has two different meanings. So, okay, what are these two different meanings? Well, it can be translated as an intellectual knowledge disclosure of it making fully known what has been a mystery in the past. So it's a disclosure, an unveiling of the truth, a spiritual enlightenment. Let's call it that. Or it could be an actual physical visionary revelation, a revealing known as a theophany of allowing one or maybe many to see and experience either with our own eyes or in our mind's eye, like a vision. So, 
Revelation, Jesus Christ, which is it? Is it the intellectual or is it the physical visionary? And the answer is, you guess it, yes. Go to the original Greek and you'll find out it's all the above. And that's exactly what the book of Revelation is. But first and foremost, Revelation, the book of Revelation is about Jesus. We're gonna learn more about Jesus than probably we've ever learned in the past. And, and it's, the focus is on Jesus Christ. Jesus, that is coming again, his second coming. He's gonna destroy evil. He's gonna destroy Satan. He's gonna judge. He's gonna reward. He's going to, to restore and redeem his people. He's going to establish the kingdom of God. That's what this is all about. Revelation, Jesus Christ, the works... Of, of what he's going to do, the person, the, the, the Godhead that he is. This is all about Jesus. Now, having said that, let's look at the name Jesus because this is also very, very important. The, uh, the name that the angel Gabriel gave that uh, appeared to Mary and said, you need to, you're going to have a baby boy and you're going to name him Yeshua. His name is Yeshua, the angel of the Lord. When he appeared to um, Joseph, he says, um, you're legally going to have a son, and you will name him Yeshua. The name of the Messiah of God incarnate is Yeshua. Okay, so how do we get from Yeshua to, to Jesus? Well, for starters, going from the original language in Hebrew to the uh, original language of uh, New Testament Greek, the Greeks had no way of pronouncing a yesh. So they could not transliterate Yeshua into Greek. So the best they could do was Iesus, Iesus. And then when it came time to translate New Testament Greek into English, the King James translators, they looked at Iesus and they said, well, we can pretty much match that in English. Isus, I-E-S-U-S, -S, or Isus. And you might say, well, wait a minute, that's not Jesus. No, it's not. Well, guess what was being translated about the same time as the New King, uh, as the King James Version? And that was the Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible was based on German. German, what letter do you use for an I and a Y? You use a J. Yeah? Jesus. J-E-S-U-S. And for some reason that stuck. Not only did that stick with the King James Version, as later versions start using the J instead of the I, but English translators all over the world, they chose to use Jesus. And I guess it's simply because they felt that because uh, the, uh, the King James set the standard, we'll just keep that as a standard. Well, guess what? That's not his name. His name is Yeshua. Let's also look at Christ. Because Christ... It's not his first, it, correction, it's not his last name. It's not first name Jesus, last name Christ. If you want to call him by his first and last name, it would be uh, Yesh, Yeshua ben Yosef. Yeshua, son of Joseph. But that's not what we read. Uh, and for a very good reason. Christ is there for a reason and a purpose. But Christ is a title. So let's go back to the origins of Christ. Christ comes from the Hebrew word Mashiach. Mashiach is translated as the anointed one. We also know Mashiach transliterated as Messiah. So Mashiach, Hebrew, Messiah, transliteration, but the translation is a title, anointed one. So when it came time to translate Mashiach um, into a Greek uh, New Testament language, um, they translated it. 
They translated anointed one into Christos, which means anointed one. Now, when it came time for the English translators to translate uh, anointed one, they chose not to translate anointed one. Why, I don't know. But what they did in their infinite wisdom was they took Christos and they took the OS off on the end and Christos became Christ or Christ. And so the English text shows them as Jesus Christ and pretty much infer Christ as his last name, which is not. His name is Yeshua. He is Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua the Anointed One. Now you might, you might say, okay, Dave, I get this, but why make such a big deal of this? Once again, there's a couple of reasons why. First and foremost, I think we can all agree that names in the Bible are important. They're there for a reason and a purpose. God puts special importance on names. <clears throat> I mean, for example, he renamed a lot of people. Uh, Jacob was renamed to what? Israel. Uh, Abram was renamed to Abraham. Uh, uh, Sarai was renamed to Sarah for a reason and for a purpose. So names are important to God. Names are important in Scripture. So, Let me say this, Yeshua is mentioned all over the place in the Old Testament, but how many of us know that? Let me give some examples. Yeshua in the Old Testament. Okay, one of the earlier examples is um, Exodus 15, verse two, where it says, the Lord, is my strength and my defense. He has become, now listen to this, he has become my Yeshua, my salvation. That's what Yeshua means. He is my God and I will praise him and my father's God and I will exalt him. Boy, that puts a little more meaning on Yeshua and not on Jesus, right? Deuteronomy 32. Verse 15, this is part of uh, Moses' uh, blessing to Israel. Jeshron, Jeshron is just a, a pet name for Israel, especially before Israel was actually a country. Jeshron grew fat and kicked and filled with food. They became heavy and sleek. They, they being the Israelites, abandoned the God who made them and rejected the rock there, Yeshua. Wow. Rejected the rock, their savior, the rock, their Yeshua. Second Samuel 22, my God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my Yeshua, the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge and my savior. From violent people, you save me. Psalms 14, 7. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. That Yeshua for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Psalms 89, 26, he will call out to me, you are my father, my God, my rock, my Yeshua, my savior. And listen to these two verses in Isaiah. And hopefully this will drive home just how important it is to know and understand the name of our Messiah and where it comes from, where the roots are from all of this. Surely God is my Yeshua, I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my Yeshua, 
my salvation. And with joy, you will draw water from the wells of Yeshua, the wells of salvation. And what did Yeshua himself say? He says, I am the living water. Brings a lot more depth and meaning to what we're talking about, or what, more importantly, what the Bible is talking about. Isaiah 49, 6. This is also a phenomenal example. He says, it is too small of a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my Yeshua may reach to the ends of the earth. I would love to expand more on this verse, but this just, once again, it shows just the importance of the word, the Hebrew word Yeshua, that is given to the Messiah, our Lord, our Savior. You shall call him Yeshua. This is why I feel like it's important. And while we're, and, and let's just look a little bit at some of the titles of uh, Yeshua in Revelation. Uh, in Revelation, we'll see Jesus is recorded in two different ways as titles. He's recorded as the Lamb. Interesting enough, not the Lamb of God, but the Lamb. He's the Lion of the tribe of Judah. We'll definitely go into that. His Messiah, his being the Lord's Messiah. And then there's Jesus' most favorite name or title for himself, the Son of Man. And there is so much we can expound on there. But let me just say for now, Son of Man comes from Daniel chapter 9. Very, very important, critical, key passage to understanding who Jesus Christ is, to understanding what Revelation is all about. He's also the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the root and offspring of David, the bright morning star, the King of the nations, and in all caps, at least in NIV, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, that is who our Lord and Savior and Messiah is. Okay? I want to make no bones about it. This is important. And since we're on uh, names and the importance of names, let's look at the name of God the Father. He has a name. He has shared his name with man. His name is recorded in the Old Testament. Guess how many times? 6,829 times his name, his personal name of God the Father, God of all creation has been shared with man. And guess what? Nobody knows what the name is because the Jews in their infinite wisdom decided if, if we don't ever want to use the Lord's name in vain, so if we never pronounce his name, we'll never uh, profane his name. What a bunch of baloney. But anyway, it is what it is. What we do know is we know at least three of the four consonants. And I say three of the four because uh, in ancient Hebrew, there were no nekuds, which are those little dots and t's down below, which kind of tells us what the vowels are, or dekeshes, which would uh, tell us whether or not it was, uh, in English at least, a um, W or a V or a Vav or a W. So, we don't know. But guess what? I'm going to pick one. And there's a reason and a purpose behind this. Most theologians today get pretty much settled on there's two renditions of what the name of God the Father, the Ancient of Days, probably was. It was either Y-H-W-H. And I remember in Hebrew, especially ancient Hebrew, there are no vowels. The reader already knows the vowels. So it was like, why do we need to put the vowel in? Modern Hebrew now has those nikuts, which are vowels. But 
So one is YHWH with, I would say, the general consensus that the vowels bring out the name Yahweh. And Yahweh, translated to English, basically means he was causing to become, he is causing to become, or he will cause to become. I think very appropriate for the name of our almighty God. The other option is YHVH. And with that, uh, the consens general consensus on the vowels brings up the name Yehovah. And notice it's Yehovah, not Jehovah. The same reason, because Jesus is not spelled with a J. Um, Yehovah is spelled with a Y. Okay, what's the meaning of Yehovah? It means he is, was, and always will be. Both of these are very appropriate uh, renditions of what we think the name of the Lord is. I'm going to choose Yahweh. And there's a reason behind this. Because Yahweh made an effort to share his personal name with man. And not only did he share it, but it's recorded in Old Testament Hebrew 6,829 times. I want to give honor where honor is due. Something that is so precious as sharing a personal name, it doesn't get any more intimate than that. And to take that away, it's so frustrating. The NIV translates... Uh, the tetragrammon, which is what uh, the, the theological, uh, theological term is, or the uh, yohe um, as Lord, all caps, L-O-R-D. But Lord is not a name. Lord is a title. Now let me just use a case in point. I married a lovely lady named Deborah. Her name is Deborah. Of course, I also, I call her Debbie or I call her Deb, but it's all, the, it's all the same. It is that level of intimacy with my wife that she is Deborah. The last thing I want to do is call Deborah the wife. I'm going to go home to the wife. Um, yes, the wife and I are going on vacation. How personal is that? How intimate is that? And that's exactly what using Lord is. Instead of Yahweh or possibly Jehovah or it could be something else, the Bible, NIV, other, other uh, texts as uh, well, this is very, very common, all caps, it'll be Lord. So um, the Lord instead of Yahweh, the Lord, the wife. Jewish people, uh, they substitute uh, every time they come across the tetragram and they will normally either say Hashem. Hashem means the name. Okay, well, that's intimate, the name. Or they'll say Adonai, which is a little more uh, respectful, I would say, which means my Lord or my master. But once again, that's a title. That's not his name. He shared his name with us. So we will make an effort that when Scripture shares his name, we will honor his name. Now, the New Testament Greek, they didn't even try uh, because then it was such a big deal back in the days of Jesus. There's no way nobody was, anybody was going to use the name of the Lord. So in the Greek, they use kurios. Kurios um, it depends on the context. It could mean master, it could mean God, it could mean Lord, or it's also a very common address of sir. Curious, my master, the slave owner, sir. There's just so much that's being missed. So we will use Yahweh. Moving on. Revelations 1, verse 1. As we're still in verse 1, by the way. Uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, Jesus, to show to 
his bondservants. Okay, so Revelation is written to show his, Jesus, bondservants. Interesting, because it didn't use the word church here. The word chosen was to show his bondservants. Okay, well, what do we mean by bondservants? First and foremost, um, like I said, the church, uh, the, it's not written to the church per se, but his bondservants, his bondservants, a good definition would be saints volunteering their life and service to the Lord that are within the church. And, and this is not putting down staff. This is not putting down elected uh, officers of the church, but bond servants are the saints volunteering their life and service to the Lord that are within the church. Now, a good definition of this in Revelation itself could be found in uh, chapter 14, verse 12. The people of God, the people of God, Jew or Gentile, who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. So what is the book of Revelation written specifically to? The people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. And this carries such a very important distinction between church and bond servants or church members and, and, and saints. Bond servants speak of individuals that have a personal relationship, a loving relationship with Jesus Christ, instead of church members that, yeah, there's a lot of church members that have that personal relationship, but there's also a lot of church members that, guess what? They see church more as a social club or a social gathering. And interesting enough, with the exception of Jesus Christ and specific instructions to write to the seven churches in Asia Minor, John avoids using the word church. And instead, depending on translation, he distinguishes bond servants as the saints or God's people or God's holy people. And we'll get much more into this uh, as we get deeper into Revelation. But Revelation, Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bond servants, the things which must soon take place. Okay, the things that must soon take place. The things will be the events which must soon take place. Okay, what are these things? What are these events? Well, what we're going to find out is you're not going to find the United States in Revelation. What you're going to find in Revelation are events that centers on Israel the Jewish people, the 12 tribes of Israel, Jerusalem, the city of God, uh, Mount Zion, the temple, um, and the surrounding states, the Middle East. The Middle East is the, is the theater, so to speak, of Revelation. This is the epicenter of Revelation. And what we're going to see in Revelation concerns, <clears throat> one moment, Fulfillment of God's covenants to his people, Israel. We're going to get really deep into God's covenants. And we're going to get deep into what we means by his people, Israel. Also, the, in, in Romans 11, Paul's going to say where all Israel will be saved. Uh, this is particularly important in the context of Revelation and in Old Testament prophecy. We will dig into that. Uh, other events. Satan. Satan is going to be unrestrained. Very, very similar to what happened uh, in the book of Job. If, if you have not read the book of Job from beginning to end, I highly recommend it because it gives us a real good foreshadow of what to expect in Revelation, of what Satan was allowed to do or not to do. If you recall, Satan was offered Job, and he says, huh, yeah, I've considered him. You've put a hedge of protection around him. And God said, well, we're going to take that protection around, away from him. But you cannot kill him. You can do anything else, but you cannot kill him. And guess what? Satan did everything else. He destroyed his family. He killed his wife, killed his children, his, his servants, destroyed all of his property. 
uh, even gave uh, Satan a horrific uh, uh, boils and, and uh, other illnesses. But we know how the story ended. Well, we know pretty much how the story begins and how the story ends in Revelation as well. So Satan will be uh, unrestrained and this will enable him to empower the Antichrist, the false prophet, um, with uh, signs and wonders that we have yet to see um, in human history. But even more importantly, it will allow Satan to pour out his wrath against God's people, against God's chosen people. And we are gonna see Satan pouring out his wrath against Israel, against the Jewish people, and against his bond servants, the church, or at least the holy ones um, that are within the church. Other events that we're going to see uh, are, is the church is rolling all this, and the church is going to have an amazing evangelistic role. This could possibly be the church's finest hour in evangelism. I would not be surprised if the church brings in a billion people during what happens in Revelation into God's kingdom, showing them what's happening and who's behind it and the reasons behind, and people will start to see that there is good, there is evil, and there is a savior, and there is salvation. Other events, the day of the Lord. And we're gonna see this repeated time and time and time and time and time and time again in Old Testament. Uh, the day of the Lord, on that day, Jesus' second coming, which uh, we're going to see the day of the Lord and Jesus' second coming, they're all one and the same. Uh, in Greek, it's referred to as the parousia. We'll get into that, but the parousia, it's a, it's, a, it's a noun, not a verb, that basically is used to describe the whole second coming and all that's going to happen uh, with the establishment of God's kingdom, uh, the day of judgment, the wraths, the rewards, uh, the marriage, all of the above. And having said that, events to, have, to come, we talked about Satan's wrath. We're definitely going to see God's wrath. This is a huge, major theme in Revelation. God will pour out his wrath. There will be judgment. There will be rewards. And we'll just let it slide there. Also, the marriage of the Lamb. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. The marriage of the Lamb is so fundamentally important and so crucial to understanding Revelation and to understanding the Old Testament as far as that goes. Um, and we will, we will definitely look into that event. And then last but not least, restoration and establishment of God's kingdom. New heaven and a new earth. Or another way of putting it, a restored heaven, a restored earth, but a new heaven and a new earth. So on that note, let's look at that. The question I have is in the New Testament, what was the gospel that was preached in the New Testament? Now, many would say, well, of course, I mean, the gospel, it's, it's, the good news is salvation. Salvation is of, of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and you die and you go to heaven. And who could disagree with that? But the question is, what was the gospel, the good news that was preached in the New Testament? Well, let's take a look. John the Baptist. John the Baptist said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Okay, the kingdom of heaven. That's kind of pre-Jesus ministry. But what did Jesus say? Jesus said in Luke 4, 43, I must proclaim the good news. I must proclaim the gospel. The gospel of what? Of the kingdom of God. To the other towns also because, listen to this, because that is why I was sent. This is the reason why I'm down here on earth, ladies and gentlemen, to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, my kingdom that's going, I'm going to come to restore. It's a very, very powerful, important word. Uh, 
But you say, well, what about the salvation part and, and, and the atoning sacrifice and all that? Well, in one sense, that's how we get into the kingdom of God. In one sense, you could say the cross is the passport into God's kingdom. And that believing in what Jesus Christ did with his atoning sacrifice, that gives us entrance into the kingdom of God. The good news is about the kingdom of God. That's the gospel. When Jesus sent his disciples out, Luke 9, 2, he sent them out to proclaim what? The kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Um, also kind of references uh, Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, but that will be another discussion. Okay, we talked about John the Baptist, Jesus, Jesus' disciples, uh, but the only big heavy hitter left is the Apostle Paul, since he was not part of the original 12. What did Apostle Paul proclaim? Glad you asked, Acts 28, 31. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the way and the truth and the life. The only way into the kingdom of God is through the Lord Jesus Christ and with all boldness and without hindrance. So hopefully that sets the stage of restoration and establishment of God's kingdom. So in talking about God's kingdom, then probably the best thing to do is to go back to the very beginning. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created what? The heavens and the earth. That's God's kingdom, right? In one sense, absolutely yes. That is God's kingdom and everything that follows before the fall. Uh, Genesis 1, 26, 28, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they, being man, may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky and over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Remember what I said at the very beginning. Everything in the Bible, every verse is there with intentionality and purpose. And so it will, this will be a good verse to break down and try to understand. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created us. He created them, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule, once again, rule. It's, a, it's an important word that we will revisit in Revelation. Rule over the fish of the sea, in the sea, and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So let me just ask this question. Why did God make us? Why did God make man, mankind, in his own image, in his own likeness? Why would God do this? The answer should be very simple and very obvious. God wants a relationship. God wants someone he can relate to on a very personal level, which we will find out. God wants a family. God wants a family. We read later on in Genesis 2, 18 and 22. The Lord, now I'm going to start using uh, Yahweh. Yahweh, God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And then Yahweh, God, made a woman from the rib. He had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. And we know what happened there. Man took a look at the woman and went, whoa, man. Yes, they are remarkable. I love women. But that's not the point. The point is God said it is not good for the man to be alone. Now, he'd already said he made him male and female. Male and female, he created them. So why did he say this? 
Got to remember, Scripture is there for a reason and a purpose. What's the underlying message in all this? It's not good for the man to be alone. Man who's been created in the image of us, guess what? It is not good for us to be alone. So I will make a helper suitable for him, just like I have made a helper suitable for us. And then Yahweh God made the woman from the rib. He had taken out a man and he brought her to man. Okay, back to chapter, uh, the last verse in chapter one, where it all comes to an end. Uh, we already know that God created the heavens and the earth and light and darkness and land and sea and mountains and valleys and rivers and fresh water and salt water and birds of the air and, and fish of the sea and, and wild animals and domestic animals. And then in verse 31, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. That, gents, is God's kingdom. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. And thus the heavens and the earth, God's kingdom, were completed in all their vast array. Your kingdom come. The gospel, the good news is the kingdom of God is coming. Okay, God prepared a special place for man. Now Yahweh God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden. Now here once again, I don't know why, but it has been decided not to translate the Hebrew word Eden. Eden is not the name of the garden. Eden translated is paradise. God had planted a garden in the east, in paradise. And there he put the man he had formed. And once again, you know, when we start thinking of the Garden of Eden and paradise, uh, then other things start to make sense. Like Jesus Christ, when he, was, when he was on the cross before he died, he looked to one of the criminals that believed in him and said, what, today you will see me in paradise. Yahweh God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for the food, for food. In the middle of the garden were, plural, the tree of life. We got this underlined as well because the tree of life is gonna be revisited big time in Revelation. And the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which was God's testing of man. We know what happened there. We definitely know what happened. Uh, after Adam and Eve's sin, Genesis 3.8, it's recorded that the man and his wife heard the sound of, of Yahweh God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So we know that Yahweh would come down and walk in the garden. Not only would he walk in the garden, but then we realize Yahweh was walking. Yahweh has legs. Yahweh has feet. Wait a minute, we're made in the image of God. So of course, yeah, more to come. We also know because man and Satan sinned, there were consequences. There were consequences to be played, to be paid. But listen to the difference here. First of all, God lashed out at the serpent, Satan. Genesis 3.14, so Yahweh God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you. You are cursed above all livestock and above all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Cursed are you, Satan. Then it came Adam and Eve's turn, to Adam specifically. He said, because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground. Not you, Adam. Cursed is the ground because of you. 
Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. There are consequences to sin, but one thing that we see here is that God did not curse man that was made in his image, man that fundamentally and ultimately was created for a relationship, ultimately created to be part of his family. And there's a marriage involved too that we will talk about later. Anyway, between uh, Genesis 3.14 and 3.17, there's Genesis 3.15. This is the first messianic prophecy in the Bible. It carries a theological name of uh, Proto-Evangelum. And Proto-Evangelum is just a theological godly good name that basically means this is the first gospel message in the Bible it talks about the future Messiah that will someday come and destroy evil, destroy Satan. And God looked at the serpent and he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Interesting, not between Adam. Between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers or most translations will say between your seed and hers. The Hebrew word zarad normally means seed, um, like, like in sperm, and hers. He, that being the offspring of the woman, will crush your head and you will strike his heel, which we find out will happen on Calvary. So this sets the beginning, a stake in the ground of a very important prophecy. And this prophecy has to do with the seed of the woman and the seed of the woman that's gonna come and destroy Satan. So from here, we have other prophecies that build on the seed of the woman. We find out in Genesis 12, the seed of the woman is gonna come from the line, the line of Abraham. And this is all part of the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12, 3. Um, it starts out, it says, I will bless those who bless you, Abraham, and whoever curses you, Abraham, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth, very, very important, but that is to be discussed later, will be blessed through him. Who's him? Well, that's the seed of the woman that's going to go through your line, Abraham. And through your offspring, that being the Jewish people, the 12 tribes of uh, Jacob or Israel, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Wow. Goes on. End of Genesis, Genesis 49, where... Jacob is blessing, uh, before he dies, he is blessing his 12 sons. And not only is he blessing them, but he's giving prophetic messages. And in Genesis 49, verse eight, he comes to his son Judah. And his son Judah is not his firstborn. And for Judah, he says, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies, your father's sons will bow down to you, Judah. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lioness. Who dares to rouse him? And then he says this. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until, until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nations shall be his. Wow, where did that come from? 
He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. There is so much prophecy behind all this that uh, goes all the way to Revelation 19. But we find out that the seed of the woman is going to go through the Lion of Judah. Or we could say the Messiah was the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Moving on. We find out later, 2 Samuel, that the seed of the woman is going to come through the line of King David. And with that, there's a Davidic covenant that we won't get into, but it's there and it's there for a reason and a purpose and it's important. Second uh, Samuel 7, Yahweh declares to you, David, that Yahweh himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you. Your own flesh and blood and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Let me say that again. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So finding out that the seed of the woman is going to go through the line of King David, all of a sudden now these prophecies start building on each other and become more and more important and more and more powerful and more and more relevant of what God is doing in this earth, what God is doing with man. And then we read in Psalms 2.2, 2, he, the seed of the woman, will be called the anointed one. Messiah. Psalms 2, 2, the kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against Yahweh and against his anointed Mashiach or Messiah saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. So we're finding out that the seed of the woman is going to come through the, the line of, of Abraham. He's going to come through Judah. He's going to rule and reign with an iron scepter. Uh, he's going to go through the line of David where he's going to establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And... Um, he will be Messiah. And as we find out, we'll find out later, he will destroy Satan. So that's, shall we say, one of the early, more fundamental prophecies that has to deal with God's kingdom. And ultimately, what we saw at the beginning in Genesis and what we will see at the end with the new heaven and earth. Okay, we're now going to discuss the marriage of the Lamb, but I'm going to cut off this tape just to give us a break. And then part two, we will discuss the marriage of